Now we're going to look at uh, item number three here, which is where we start working lactose, uh, uh, glucose into the picture as well as lactose. Now let's go back to this graph that we had a minute ago. So uh, in this graph here, the only sugar that was present is lactose. So in other words, there was no glucose around. So for this first line that we draw, uh, there is no glucose. So let's think about how this would look different if there was glucose present. So I'm going to use a dotted line to represent that. So uh, first of all, we're still looking at the expression of this enzyme, the beta-galactosidase enzyme, the expression of the LACZ gene. And so really there would be no difference here uh, in the presence or absence of glucose for this. It would still be very low. Now here at this point we add lactose. And what you're going to see is you will get a little bit of an increase in expression, but it won't be very much, right? So not nearly as much as if you only have lactose present. And its dynamics are going to be the same, that once the lactose is removed, then the levels go back down close to zero. So this dotted line here represents what happens if glucose is present. So remember that glucose is the preferred energy source. And so this makes sense here too, right? If glucose and lactose are both present, you do get a little bit of expression of these genes, but it's not nearly as much as if lactose is the only sugar. So now we're gonna look at how glucose influences the regulation of LACZ. So this comparison here gives you an idea of how this interaction between lactose and glucose in the cell takes place. So here, this double line here represents the plasma membrane of a cell. And uh, so the, the little orange uh, hexagons here represent lactose, and the blue hexagon represents glucose. So here on this side, you can see that there's nothing but lactose present in the environment, and there's some lactose inside the cell. So here on this side, you can see that we have both lactose and glucose present in the environment, and you can see that there's just glucose inside the cell. So we know that in the presence of glucose, LACZ expression is inhibited. And based on the image here, what do you think is the best reason for that? Is it that glucose inhibits RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter? Is it because glucose inhibits lactose from entering the cell? Or is it because glucose binds to the DNA near LACZ to inhibit expression? Well, as far as these pictures go, really the only one of these statements that's really supported is this one here. Right? that in the presence of glucose, the lactose is excluded from the cell and only the, the glucose can get in. Whereas here, when there's only lactose present, then the lactose is able to get in. So how does that work? The, the activity of glucose in all of this, or its ability to influence uh, laxy expression, is referred to as inducer exclusion. So let's think about that. Inducer in this case, remember the inducer for the, the LAC operon is lactose. And exclusion, that means you keep it out of the cell. All right, so we have to think about the plasma membrane of a cell. So let's draw a cell here with a double line to represent the plasma membrane. And so there's lactose in the environment. But of course it's inside the cell that we have the DNA and the promoter and the operator and all of these things that, that uh, are required for giving ex us expression of LACZ. So before lactose can influence the expression of LACZ, it has to get inside of the cell. All right, so we have lactose outside of the cell, it has to get inside the cell before it can have this effect on expression. So Lactose is a polar molecule, it's a large molecule, it can't cross the membrane by itself. So what it needs is some sort of a channel protein, an integral membrane protein here in the membrane that can allow it to go in. And this protein here is called a permease. And this permease allows the lactose to enter the cytoplasm, and then once it's in there, then it can exert its effect on gene expression. Okay, so what does glucose do? Glucose blocks the, do this in red here, glucose blocks 
that permease. And it, in doing so, it prevents the lactose from entering. So glucose blocks the permease. All right, so as we just go back to this image here, so what's going on, right? On this side here, when we have only lactose present in the environment, there's permease in the membrane and the lactose can get inside. Here, when we have both lactose and glucose in the environment, then the permease is blocked and the glucose can get in, but the lactose is excluded. All right, now when we take this back and think about this in the context of our graph here, right? So now we have a better feel for how all of this works, right? Um, in the absence of glucose, which is our solid line here, when we add lactose, we get induction. We get expression of beta-galactosidase. And when we remove the lactose, then that expression goes down. Now, if there is glucose present, we still get a little bit of induction, but it's much lower. So what this says is that the cell is a little bit leaky to the lactose, even in the presence of glucose. When you have that, uh, that channel blocked by the glucose, that permease is blocked, there's still a little bit of lactose that gets in, and that is enough to induce a, a, a small level of beta-galactosidase expression, but for the most part, the glucose has excluded that. So when we think about gene expression in prokaryotes, uh, we can really think about genes being expressed either negatively through what we can call negative control or positively through positive control. Now, so far, we've really covered one example of negative control, and the idea behind negative control is that there is some protein that binds to DNA and it binds near to the promoter sequence. So protein binds DNA near the promoter and the effect of this is that it prevents RNA polymerase from transcribing the gene. So protein binds near binds the DNA near the promoter and prevents RNA polymerase from transcribing the gene. Okay, and the example that we've seen like so far is the repressor protein of the lac operon. So that's our example. Now, in the lac operon, there really isn't a good example of positive control, but we can think in generally about what that would mean if we compare it to negative control. In positive control, it also involves a protein that binds onto the DNA near the promoter, but in this case, it has the effect of making it more likely that transcription is gonna happen or that RNA polymerase will start transcribing the gene. So, positive control, we have a protein that binds DNA near the promoter. So far, they're exactly the same. But in this case, it helps the RNA polymerase either bind to the promoter or start transcription. Okay, so both of them involve proteins binding to DNA near the promoter, negative control, that protein that binds has a negative effect, and in positive control, that protein that binds, it helps. It helps the RNA polymerase either interact with the DNA or initiate transcription. Now, I'm about to give you a good example of positive control, but to do that, we have to think about a whole different system uh, a different operon and a different molecule that controls it. So here we have a new sugar molecule. This is called an arabinose, but it's still a little carbohydrate. And uh, just like glucose, arabinose can be used uh, as an energy source for cells. Okay, but again, arabinose, it's not always present, and the enzymes that are required to break down arabinose are only needed when arabinose is around. So, uh, we're going to start by drawing the another operon here. So let's give ourselves a nice long piece of DNA to start off with here. 
And here is going to be the start of transcription. And now this operon contains two genes. Uh, one of them is called, oops, era A. And then also era B. And so these, this encodes two enzymes, and both of these enzymes are required to, uh, to break down arabinose. All right, so we only really want high expression of these genes when arabinose is present. Okay, now upstream here of the start of transcription, we have, again, a promoter. And now we have another sequence that's going to be important for us that's actually on the other side of the promoter relative to the start codon, and this is called the initiator. The initiator. Okay, so the promoter, again, this is still going to be the place where RNA polymerase binds to begin transcription. So here's our RNA polymerase. And the, there is another protein that binds here to this initiator sequence, and it is encoded by a gene called ERA C. And so we're just going to label this protein here as uh, ERA C. Okay, now this is going to look a lot like something you've seen before, but there's an important fundamental difference here. I'm going to let's shade this in just so it, we can distinguish it from our RNA polymerase. All right, so the ERA C can do two things. It can bind to the initiator, or sometimes it is off here. It undergoes a conformational change that prevents it from binding the, uh, the initiator there. All right, so it can either come off of the initiator or it can bind on to the initiator. And it has to do one of those two things. Now, so what controls it? Well, it, you won't be surprised to find it's controlled by arabinose. So if there is arabinose present, then the arabinose binds on to the ERA C. So there's an arabinose sugar bound onto that ERA C. That induces a conformational change, which allows it to bind the initiator sequence there. And if there's no arabinose around, or low arabinose, then the RSC protein is coming off of the initiator. So if we have, in this case, low concentrations of arabinose, then most of the arabinose is going to be in this state here. Whereas if we have high concentrations of the arabinose, then the arabinose will be bound to the RSC and it's going to bind onto the initiator. So here's, this This looks a lot like the thing we had before with lactose and the repressor protein, but here's the big difference. When RSC is bound onto the initiator, it actually has a positive effect on the RNA polymerase binding. So the RSC bound onto the initiator improves RNA polymerase's binding to the promoter. So. ERA-C binding to the DNA at that position there called the initiator. It helps RNA polymerase bind, helps RNA polymerase bind and ultimately start transcription. Right. So this is an example of positive control, right? This ERA-C protein, when it's bound to the DNA, it has a positive effect and it makes it more likely that we're going to get transcription of these. And that makes sense too, right? We want to transcribe these genes when arabinose is present. And so when arabinose is present, the arabinose binds to ERA-C, ERA-C binds to the initiator, and we get transcription.